Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Edmund O'Brien in Richard Henry Dana's Two Years Before the Mass on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Newton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present our dramatization of Richard Henry Dana's Two Years Before the Mast, an American classic. Published just over a century ago, when its author was only 25 years old, it captured the hearts of the reading public in the days when California was still a province of Mexico, and when the few Americans who went there usually chose the long and hazardous journey by sailing ship round Cape Horn. This trip Dana made, and the result was his great book. A few years later, it became a tremendous success when the gold rush made everyone anxious to find out what sort of a place California really was. To play the part of our hero, we are fortunate indeed to have that talented and popular actor, Edmund O'Brien. And now a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of Two Years Before the Mast. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, that hallmark on the back is your guide. Like the sterling on silver, it's a mark of distinction that all quickly recognize, and it tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Richard Henry Dana's Two Years Before the Mast, starring Edmund O'Brien. A thin, pale young man stands at the library window and blinks his eyes at the sunlight streaming through the glass. He has stood thus often, listening to his father debate the capabilities of President Andrew Jackson, the affairs of the city of Boston, and the problems of rearing a son without the aid of a mother. Richard Henry Dana, Jr. listens this afternoon and smiles across the room at Sarah. Sarah, so young and understanding. Richard, the whole project is unbecoming of a Dana. You're a gentleman, the grandson of our first minister to Russia, the chief justice of the Commonwealth. And penniless, Father. What little we have, you need. And I can't afford the luxury of a long sea voyage as a paying passenger. Sarah, my dear, perhaps you can persuade him. Sometimes the advice of a friend is more welcome. Richard, do you believe the sea will improve your health? It's my only hope, Sarah. My eyes are failing so rapidly I can't read. What good was Harvard to me when I couldn't study? But to ship clear to the northwest coast of America as a common seaman, you're too frail, my boy. Father, if I'm ever to be a lawyer, I've got to have the health to practice. And to be a good lawyer, I've got to know people. Not our Boston gentlemen, not rich boys and sailing in fancy passenger quarters, but real men, sailing men, the best and the worst. Sarah, what are we going to do with him? Richard, I'll miss you. Yet you want me to go, don't you? Yes going to be a long time. A year. Perhaps a year and a half. You'll write to us? From every port between here and California. I'm going to keep a journal, too. And I'll let you read it when I get back. That is, if you're still interested. I'll be interested, Richard. Always. August 16th, 1834. The brig Pilgrim, Captain Thompson commanding, is now at sea. I came aboard dressed in the checked shirt, the duck trousers, and varnished black hat of the seasoned sailor. But I found it takes more than correct costume to fool a real seaman. Hey, lads, look at those softy white hands and the dancing school way he walks. Boys, we've got a gentleman in the folk. <laughs> I laughed with them. And by the time we had dropped down Boston Bay, we were all friends. This evening, the crew was called aft, and Captain Thompson surveyed us, cigar in mouth. Men, we've begun a long voyage. All you have 
like to do is obey your orders and you'll get along with me. If you don't, you'll fare hard, I can tell you. Pull together and you'll find me a clever fellow. Otherwise, you'll find me a devilish rascal. That's all I've got to say. Go below the larboard watch. I was in the starboard watch, so I remained on deck. The night was clear and moonlit. There was no sound except the creaking of the rigging and the swash of the sea. Above me, and extending far out over the gunwales, rose cloud upon cloud of gleaming white sail, towering up until they seemed almost to touch the stars. For the first time, I was lonely. Boston, Harvard, my past life and friends, all were flowing away from me like the silent wake of the ship. Shortly before my watch ended, the moon went behind the clouds, the wind freshened, and long, heavy swells began to roll under the bows. I felt them very definitely in my stomach. Mr. Hammerson! Yes, sir? Haul down and clew up the rails. Flying jib and studding. Go ahead, men. Where you are? What the orders meant, I didn't know, but I sprang into the rigging with the others, up and up and up. Finally, I turned and looked down. The deck was a hundred feet below, a tiny thing, which one moment swung below me, and the next moment there was only black water. I crawled out onto one of the yards where Sam was pulling in sail. Just as I reached him, I slipped and plunged head forward. Ah! No, you don't. You ain't going below yet. One huge hand had me by the collar and was dragging me back onto the yard. What's the matter, mate? Seasick. You'll get over it. Sam, you, you saved my life. A word of advice, mate. Don't let the boys hear you say that. You're Jack Tar now. No thankies and no shivering in your boots. Whatever happens, we make it a big joke. Yes, I understand. Then get in sail. October 1st across the equator in longitude 24 degrees, 24 minutes west. My eyes are much improved, and my whole health. All this on a diet of salt beef, hard tack, and tea. November 17th, another storm. Awakened from sleep by the cry most dreaded at sea. It was George Balmer, the happy-go-lucky English boy. We lowered the quarter boat and searched for an hour, though we knew it was hopeless. No talking or smiling in the forecastle tonight. January 14th, 1835. Provisions had all but given out. The crew was nervous and grumbling. And then this morning, we made land. Santa Barbara, California, 150 days out of Boston. We lined the railing and stared at the distant beach and the belfry of the mission of Santa Barbara. Yes, yeah, sweet sight, aren't they nice? Yes. I was wondering, you see those men coming down the beach carrying tremendous loads on their heads? Yeah, that's what we'll be doing, mate. Oh? Packing cattle hides on our skulls, then loading them into the long boats and rowing out here to the ship. We'll carry them back to Boston. Boston makes them into shoes, and we bring them back and sell them to the Mexicans. <laughs> it's kind of like life, ain't it, me? Yes. How long do you suppose it will take us to load the hides? Oh, a year. A year? Maybe longer. Yeah, home's a long way off for us. Nothing ahead but work and trying to keep in with the captain. And that last will be a plenty. March 11th. After touching at Santa Barbara, we sailed north to Monterey, the headquarters of the Governor General. Here, the Mexican customs officers came aboard and inspected the cargo which we had brought to sell. And sell we did. Then began our loading of the hides and the trouble with the captain. 
First, he denied us our Sunday day of rest. Then, one wet evening, he called the crew on deck to stand about all night in the rain, simply to watch it rain, as he put it. This morning, I was standing by the main hatchway. I heard the sound of blows behind me. Then, the captain shouting at Sam. Well, then, will you ever give me any more of your jaw? I never gave you any, sir. You come aft with me. But Captain Thompson... You'll uh, take orders from me or by heaven I'll flog you. I'm no slave, sir. Then I'll make you one. Mr. Amazine... Yes, sir. Seize up that man. Make a spread eagle of him. I'll teach you all who is master aboard. Thank you, sir. Tie his wrist to the rig and get his shirt off. Stimson, don't say it, Dana, don't say it. But we can't let a man be flogged. If we speak up, it's mutiny. If we stop him, it's piracy. Either way, the old man's got us. And if we do nothing, he's still got us. That's life at sea, mate. There's no law but the captain. Ah, oh, Mr. Amazon, that rope, if you please. Yes, sir. Captain, why are you going to flog that man? Who said that? Why, sir? Yonder sea. Mr. Amazon, seize him up also. Stimson, these are men, not animals. Human beings made in God's own light. Keep quiet, you fool, or you'll be next. There! Will you ever give me any more of your jaw? And now you, Swede. Sir, have I ever refused my duty? Have I ever been insolent? No, it's not that I flog you for. I'll tell you what for. It's because I like to do it. It suits me, yes. I like to do it. Now, look at them, all of you. You see where I've got every last man of you? You didn't know what I was. Now you know. I'm a slave driver. A flogging slave driver. Mr. Amazon, cut them down. I ask you. I'm going ashore. And those two whimpering hounds are going to roll me. Dana, you awake? Yes, I can't sleep. Thinking? Uh, when we get home, Stimson, I'm going to do something about the sort of thing we saw today. Uh, what's to be done? I don't know. But if God ever gives me the means, I'll do my best to end such tyranny. If you get home. Yes. California. A corner of the world the Lord has forgotten and the devil wouldn't have. We're 16,000 watery miles from anybody or any law that can help us. But we've got to believe, Stimson. We've got to keep telling ourselves when we get home. When we get home. I'll get there, Stimson. I've got to. Just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Two Years Before the Mast, starring Edmund O'Brien. You know, I so often use the phrase, Hallmark card, say what you want to say the way you want to say it. That sometimes I'm afraid you might think words are the only outstanding quality of Hallmark cards. Actually, when I use that phrase, I mean the words plus the manner in which the words are presented. The right design to illustrate those words, the most beautiful colors to bring out the design. The overall feeling, whether it's light-hearted gaiety or warm-hearted affection, you want to express when you send a Hallmark card. It takes all of these and all put together in the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature to bring you the Hallmark card that truly says what you want to say the way you want to say it. For years, Hallmark cards have done just that. That's why the Hallmark on the back of the card you send means so much. Why it means you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of Two Years Before the Mast, starring Edmund O'Brien. Far off coast of California, the crew of the Brig Pilgrim toiled through the months to collect a cargo of bullock hides. One year before, Richard Dana had shipped as a sickly young Boston gentleman with failing eyesight. Now he labored from dawn till dusk, curing hides on the beach, carrying them through the surf, rowing them to the ship, stowing them in the hold, and with it all, still had the energy to make entries in his journal. 
July 8th, 1835. Today, another ship came to port, and with it, mail from Boston. As I devoured the lines written so many months ago by my father and by Sarah, I was swept with homesickness and a loathing of the monotony and tyranny of my present life. It was a feeling shared by others in the forecastle. Mates, make up your minds to this. We leave our bones drying on the beach of this blasted California. No, no, he says. We ain't got half a cargo of high jet. We'll be rotting here for another two or three years. And with Captain Thompson to ride over us... He won't ride over me. I'm being transferred to the ship alert. But what? what you think? It came in today's mail. The company is sending me home by its next ship. The alert, is it? Yes. We sail up the coast for more cargo, then put back here. After that, Cape Horn and home. Home. Oh. While the rest of us go on rotting here. And you figure to be free of the captain? I will be. You know what I heard the captain tell the mate on deck? They've got orders, too. Captain Thompson and Mr. Amazon are being transferred <laughs> to the alert. December 4th, 1835, aboard the alert. We coasted north from Santa Barbara, intending to take on more hides at Monterey. But meeting a storm, we were blown off course and have now put into the Bay of San Francisco. The Mexicans have a garrison here, the Presidio, and at some distance is the Mission Dolores. The one other habitation at San Francisco is a board shanty built by a Yankee trader who deals with the Indians. A large number of deer abound on the hills. The bay itself is enormous, and there is an island of rock near its entrance called Alcatraz. April 15, 1836. Southward again to San Diego, where we dropped anchor alongside the brig Pilgrim. I met my old friends Sam and John the Swede and Stimson. They are as happy to be free of Captain Thompson as I am unhappy to be still with him. This evening, that gentleman called me aft to his cabin. Janet, do you still expect to go home with me on the alert? Why, certainly, sir. We were both transferred to the ship. Then you must get someone to stay in your place aboard the Pilgrim. Why, sir? Because I said so. Remember this, Dana. We're a long way from the United States. This is Mexico territory. There's no American consul for you to run to. No law except your captain. No rights except those it pleases me to give you. It won't always be so, sir. Won't it? <laughs> captain, if I do not return to Boston aboard the alert, the company will know about it. And why? I'll see to that. Oh. You think to back me down because you're a gentleman, son, and not a common hand before the man. I am both, sir. And I mean that both shall be equal before you and the law. Tell English Ben to report to me. I'll send him over to the pilgrim in your place. Now, get out of here. May 8th. 1836, our last day in California. At noon, all hands came above and stood about, waiting for the breeze to rise. The captain and the mate stationed themselves aft and stared to windward. The moment was almost here, for which I had waited 16 long months. Dana. Yes. You know what we're carrying in that cargo? Well, you helped load it, Harry. 40,000 hides and 30,000 horns. Aye, and besides that? Well, uh, our provisions. And gold. Gold. Seen the bag the dust carried into the captain's cabin myself. Mm. I've heard stories that the Indians and Mexicans were finding gold inland somewhere. But I guess it doesn't mean much to us. To me it does. I'm coming back to California and find me a fortune. Uh -huh. Mr. Amazon! There's the wind! All hands lay aloft and loose stand! Aye, 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 sir. Sir. July 1st, 
We are now nearly up to Cape Horn. From captain down to cook, all are uneasy, for July is the worst month of the year to attempt Cape Horn. July 3rd, the sun rose at 9 and set at 3. 18 hours of darkness. Today, while I was standing my trick at the helm, I heard the lookout call from the rigging. Sail ho! Well away! Large on the weather bow, sir! Look again! That's no sail, it's an iceberg! July 4th. Independence Day in Boston. What firing of guns and ringing of bells there must be. A hot July sun and ice cream for all. But down here, only ice. Miles upon miles of field ice and towering icebergs that dwarf our ship into a child's toy. He swept the deck clean. We'll never make Boston, mate. Never. July 14th. The deck is covered with snow. The sails, solid ice. The wind, a steady bombardment of hail. The hull has sprung a leak in the forecastle. No dry berths for us and no dry clothing for two weeks past. We've tried Cape Horn twice and failed. September 26th, 1836. This evening, the ship Alert comes to her wharf in Boston Harbor. So ends this journal and my two years before the mast. The time has come to make good use of both. Richard, you must publish this. I intend to, Father. I'm going to rewrite the journal, get it into book form, and let the American people learn of the abuses of their seamen. This tyranny of irresponsible captains must stop. If only there were proper laws, some protection... They'll come. Meanwhile, there must be attorneys to fight for them, men who aren't afraid to challenge shipmasters and ship owners. You, Richard? Yes, Father. My boy, seamen have little money to spend on attorneys. You have to think of your future and the future of someone else. I am. Sarah has never been out of my mind, and pray God she will never be out of my life. Dana Jr., attorney at law. Oh, I do like it, Richard. It looks wonderful on the door. Well, I'm, I'm afraid it looks more impressive than the office inside. Come on. <laughs> oh, gentlemen, I'll be with you in a moment. Mr. Dana. Mr. Dana, you remember me, sir. Why, John! John, why, how are you, you old swabby? I just made port, sir. The boys told me about your book. We are all reading it, sir. Sarah. I want you to meet an old friend. Beyond the sweet, ma'am. I'm in the book. I'm famous now. I'm so glad to know you, John. How do you do, ma'am? Uh, Mr. Dana, my skipper's been using me pretty bad. I was wondering if you could help me. Certainly, John. I'll be glad to discuss your case, but if you'll excuse me a moment. Oh, yeah, I'll... of course. Thank you. <gasps> this is your private office? Yes. Not much to look at, and with my type of clients, I'm afraid it smells a bit of the forecastle. They're good men. They need you. That's what matters. Sarah, you know, I'd hope to make a little money out of my book, but, well, I I was paid only $250. The goodest doing can't be measured in dollars. No, I, I can't expect any riches from anything I write. Sarah, well, well, what I'm trying to say... Let me say it, Richard. Your prospects are poor, your work will be hard and often without pay. We'll have to skimp and live in second-rate quarters... And wish we had more to give our children. But we'll be happy, dear. Divinely happy. Sarah. Oh, my darling. 
My dearest. You know, I'm still something of a seaman at heart. Sailors are shy men. They're awkward at saying the important things. Yet now I can say freely and gladly, I love you, Sarah. I love you as passionately as the seaman loves the sea, as surely as the tides upon it, and as eternally as the North Star above it. Sarah, I love you. Hilton will return in a moment. Most of us have a hard time when we try to express our love for our mothers. We hardly ever get beyond the quickly stammered thank you phrases of, gee, you're a peach mom, or thanks, mother, that's swell. She understands what we mean, of course, but they're hardly words she'd treasure in her heart and remember through the years, would you say? That's why on one day of the year, we all like to get sentimental and tell mother of the love that is in our hearts. And that day is not far off. Two weeks from Sunday, May 13th, is Mother's Day. So I thought you'd like to be reminded tonight that the new Hallmark Mother's Day cards are now at the fine stores where you regularly buy Hallmark cards. By choosing yours early, you'll be extra sure to find the one that says exactly what you want to say the way you want to say it to your mother. A Hallmark card will add meaning to any gift you're planning to give her because the words so beautifully express your feelings and tell of your love. And uh, you know it's your love she wants above everything else. Here again is James Hilton. Well, you certainly brought adventure into our lives tonight, Edmund O'Brien. Thanks for a grand performance. An invitation to appear on the Hallmark Playhouse is always welcome, Mr. Hilton. Like Hallmark cards, it's a pleasure and a compliment to receive. Well, you know, you always have a standing invitation to visit us, Eddie. Who's going to be on the Hallmark Playhouse with you next week, Mr. Hilton? We're particularly happy to announce that next week our star is a very charming actress who right this minute is celebrating an opening night on Broadway. We take you now backstage to the Morosco Theater in New York for the voice of Miss Sarah Churchill. Thank you, Mr. Hilton, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very thrilling night for me because less than an hour ago, the curtain went up on Gramercy Ghost, a new play making its debut tonight. We still have a final act to go so my time with you will be brief. However, I'm particularly happy that a week from tonight will also mark another opening night for me, my first appearance on the Hallmark Playhouse. The story is A Breath of Air. I hope very much that you will be listening. We're all looking forward to it, Sarah. A Breath of Air by that distinguished novelist Rumor Godden, whose stories have lately been attracting so much attention on both sides of the Atlantic. And now for the makers of Hallmark Cards and all of us on the Hallmark Playhouse, may I wish you great success in your Broadway opening tonight. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray and Bernard Herman. And our script tonight was adapted by Leonard St. Clair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> For Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Edmund O'Brien may currently be seen co-starring in the Paramount picture Redhead and the Cowboy. The role of Sarah Watson tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle, and Ted DeCorsia was Captain Thompson. Others in our cast were Polly Bear, Ted Osborne, Bill Conrad, and Peter Leeds. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Sarah Churchill in Rumor Godden's A Breath of Air. And the week following, Gladys Hasty Carroll's A Man's Mother, starring Ethel Barrymore. And the week after that, Carl Van Doren's Benjamin Franklin, starring the other great Barrymore, Lionel, on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri, celebrating its 30th anniversary of broadcasting.